church, it is so great to be with all of you today. It is great to have our joy ringers here today. Woohoo! Well, we want to welcome you all. You guys can hear me okay? There we go. Woohoo! We want to welcome you all to the First United Methodist Church of Claremont, Florida. This is the best place to be on a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Welcome to you all here. Welcome to you all at home. Let us stand as we worship God together wherever we are. And world cannot gather yet, even on Sunday mornings. And here we do. We live in Florida. We get to gather. And to do that, we though need to wear the masks. So if you're returning today for the first time, and we have a lot of you returning, let's and here for the first time in general, let's give you all a welcome. <laughs> glad you're back. Very glad to see you. And so with that being said, that's how we make you safe and keep you safe. Um, wear the masks while you're here. And also at the end of the service, you know, we do exit a little differently. You'll just have to watch the ushers and they'll guide you out one row at a time. And the other thing we do is give you a connect card that we would love for you to fill out so that we know who is here. And we will have a basket for you on the way out where you can put those. But while you're doing that, if you would let us know any prayer requests or any questions you have, we would love to connect you um, even to our We Care team if you want to be a shepherd or if you need a shepherd. Again, all these things you can write down on your Connect card. 
all you online, there are so many of you tuning in. Let's give you guys a hand. We're glad you're here. If you're watching on TV, we have this new QR code. You can use your little phone and take a photo of it, and, and then we will get your attendance right now. We also have a link in the chat, so you can click on that. But also create community with each other. Continue to say hi. I love watching where you're all watching from as we're live streaming, so continue to do that. But we also have a We Care team throughout the week that you can email anytime and we will help um, answer questions, pray for you, whatever you guys need as well. So use that We Care email address and we will definitely connect with you during the week. Couple of announcements on May 1st. If you all have teenagers, maybe you know teenagers, our middle school and high school uh, youth are having a one day retreat here on campus and we want them to register their attendance and get signed up so that we can plan but I want to ask you all to pray for our youth, especially on May 1st. Pray for Mac, pray for Alyssa, the world that these teenagers are dealing with way more than I ever dealt with and all of you dealt with. And they need our prayer. And we are blessed to have this amazing youth program where they are growing, not only in number, but they are growing deeper in faith. So we want to keep them in prayer and again, encourage youth that you see to join the youth program here. We also have the Blood Mobile coming on May 2nd here on campus. So save the date, 8.30 to 1.30. The one Blood Mobile will be parked in the Sanctuary South lot. You can go ahead online, reserve a time in advance, or you can show up that day. And we just are grateful to have that opportunity. But right now we've come gathered near and far to worship, to connect with God. So let us take a few moments as we prepare our hearts to connect with Christ. As we gather before God, either at home or in our place that we are dwelling in right now, or perhaps here in the sanctuary, I just am feeling led. We would just quiet our hearts and minds and let us just go to God in a few moments of silent prayer so that we can just give Him our requests and feel and be connected to His presence. So let us pray. just pray that you would just quiet our spirits right now. Help us to release all of our thoughts, our concerns, our cares over into your hands. Because Lord, you are with us in this very place. You desire for us to focus on you above all the things of our hearts. And Lord, so often we are running, we are watching, and we miss that you are right here in our presence. When you desperately try to get our attention, we overlook it because of the many things in the world. So Lord, now as we come, may we seek you, may we experience you, Lord. 
And may we encounter you like never before. We thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity always to know when we open our eyes, you are right there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You always show up. You always give us glimpses of you when we only would look right your way. So, Lord, as we come, be honored in this time as we now have the honor to lift up our prayer out loud, the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our worship, we have so much to be grateful for, and we want to continue to thank you for all the amazing gifts, the offering, the tithes that faithfully this congregation and beyond continues to give to the church Today, as we would normally pass the the offering plate around, we don't do that anymore, but what we will have is a basket on the way out for those that brought your checks. You can still do it that way. But over half of our tithes have been coming in online, so we want to thank you. And if you want to try that opportunity, especially those at home, you can text in your gift. You can go to the website. And also, there's a new QR code that you can just put your phone up to it, and it'll also take you to the place of giving. But as we do, I want to just point out a few of our missions, as um, so many needs have increased. As we know COVID struck, and the needs were great before COVID, they have become exponentially greater than we could have ever imagined. But God continues to meet those needs. The one thing you're going to get today on your way out is the, ba- the paper bag that we traditionally, every Mother's Day, we have you take that home, fill it with toiletries, and bring it back on Mother's Day. And initially, it was just for the haven. The haven is a blessing to many women and children who find themselves in the homes of a domestic violence situation. Unfortunately, yet fortunately, I have sent people myself to the haven to get help. And they are there in time of need, and so the toiletries go to help them. However, the gifts um, that we give to them, the needs have now increased beyond the haven. We now give to Faith Neighborhood Center, Forward Path, uh, Find Feed and Restore, New Beginnings, and many other places. So the list is on the website. On your way out, those that are here, you can pick up the bag. It'll tell you what to bring in. Those online, go to the website. You don't have to have our bag, and you can bring those to the church office during the week, and we will be giving those to those in need. The next mission I want to point out is a huge one that the community is now partnering with, this brand new Central Florida Hope Center. It's on Highway 27, and what they do is they have a faith, like Faith Neighborhood Center, they have a food pantry, but they teach you how to spend your money in the most efficient way. So the people that come in, they're going to help you spend the money, the, the, the kind of the play money that they give you so that they're teaching you how to make a dollar go a long way. They also have job placement, and they also have free care counseling. Now, we're wanting to help partner with them, and one way we're doing that is going to help you <coughs> sign up for a 5K You can walk, you can run, whatever you want to do. It's on May 15th, and we want to just invite you to go to the website and sign up for that opportunity, or just make a donation if you don't want to walk or run. And again, it's a huge resource, but God is just filling so many needs through the gifts and the life of his church. So as we continue to worship, as our bells, our joy ringers, bring us into that space of worship. Let us just thank God for all he does in our lives.
was beautiful, right? All right. Can y'all hear me? No. How about now? No? Getting better? One more time. Hey, I can hear myself now. Yeah. Well, good morning, church family. Well, it's an honor to be with you. I have not had the chance to meet you. My name is Chris, and I serve as one of the pastors here on staff. And it's an honor and a privilege to be with you, amazing and beautiful 11 o'clockers. So I'm very excited to be with you this morning as we are beginning a brand new teaching series entitled Resurrection Stories. So as I am here with y'all this morning, I want you to know I am honored, I am privileged, and, and I'm really excited because I love to be able to have the opportunity to bring God's Word. Uh, to start this morning, I want to have a little bit of fun. It's okay. Take a deep breath. Fun is allowed in church. I don't know if you know this. It's okay. It's allowed. Not only is it allowed, it's encouraged. Um, church should be a place where we engage, we interact, we have fun, we enjoy one another, because honestly, there's too many other things that are, if I can just say it for lack of better terms, depressing. That church doesn't need to be another one. This should be a place of great joy and fun, all right? So let's have some fun. Let's, let's interact a little. All right, here we go. This is going to be call and response. I'm going to ask a question. I want you to raise your hand if this applies to you. Here we go. Have you ever met anybody famous? Have any of you ever met, by a show of hands, somebody who's famous? Maybe you met an actor. Maybe you met a musician, an author, an entertainer, maybe a magician who made themselves disappear, and you were like, thank goodness that person's gone. Like, have you ever met somebody famous? So I see a lot of hands. We see a lot of hands. Now, let me follow that up with asking this question. Have you ever met or been in the presence of someone famous and had no idea? Have you ever been out and met somebody, stood there with them, and had no idea that this person was famous? Well, I, I had this happen to me a couple years back. I was living in Chicago at the time. I was working at a church there in the city, and a buddy of mine was a youth pastor like myself, but he was down in Fort Lauderdale. So we had began talking about the fact that there was this church conference going on in Chicago, and him and his pastor and their team were going to fly from Fort Lauderdale up to Chicago, and we were all going to do this together. It was going to be awesome. I was really excited. So they came. They landed at the airport. I drove over, and I, I had this little compact car at the time. It sat maybe two people comfortably, but we fit five of us in there somehow. Like, I think the guy in the back seat in the middle was on top of other people, um, and I think that was the pastor. So, like, Dylan, my buddy, was the youth pastor. He came with his pastor. And as we began talking, I didn't really know his pastor very well. I was asking him about, you know, what's it like to be in ministry? And all of these different questions. Well, well, lo and behold, in the middle of the conversation, I had no idea, but he let me know that he comes from a pretty famous family. Like, he's the grandson of Billy Graham. Like, anybody ever heard of Billy Graham? A couple of people. Okay, just making sure. So I had no idea. I'm in the car with this, with this gentleman who's pastoring this church at the time. And, and really, like, my whole connection to this guy was my buddy Dylan, the youth pastor. So we got there. We did day one of the conference. It was awesome. We, we had a lot of fun. I drove them back to their hotel. And then I went home and slept in my own bed because the best thing about conferences is when you can go home and sleep in your own bed. But I got up early the next morning. I drove back to where the conference was. I, I shot my buddy a message like, hey, where are you guys right now? And he's like, we're in the lobby. Come meet us. Come meet us. We're in the lobby. I'm like, all right, cool, great. So I walk in to the lobby, and I see Dylan and Tolian, his, his pastor, and, and we're all there together. And all of a sudden, this guy walks up, and no lie, the guy's maybe like, I think every service he's gotten shorter. So he's about this tall at this point. Just kidding. He's about this tall. And... Um, bald-headed guy, and, and we just got talking, and Dylan's like, hey, this is my buddy, Chris. He's the one who drugged me to church, and you know, through that youth ministry program, I gave my life to Jesus. Now I'm in ministry, and he's in ministry, and it's great, and the guy's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dylan has told me your story, you, you know, and he's repeating back to me things of my own life. I thought it was kind of crazy that I'm like, this guy I've never met before knows me. So we start talking, and, and, and it was a great conversation, just really cool hearing about him, and then he walks away. 
And my buddy Dylan turns and he looks at me. He's like, you have no idea who that was, do you? I'm like, no, I'm completely lost. And he goes, well, that's, that's Joshua Harris. Now, Joshua Harris is a really famous Christian author. He wrote this book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye, which is one of the best-selling Christian books in history. So Josh was one of the speakers at the conference, and, and, and I had no idea that I was standing there in the presence of this gentleman, this, this pseudo-Christian celebrity, this guy who's written and, and sold millions of copies of his book. Um, I would not recommend to anybody in here, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Um, it's it's kind of outdated and antiquated, but his book, Dug Down Deep, is one of my favorite books on theology, and I actually quote that book quite a bit. But it was interesting to be there, standing in the presence of this guy who's a celebrity, who's well-known in the Christian circle, and here I am, and I have no idea who this guy is. Truth be told, this could happen to the best of us. We can miss the fact that we're standing with or talking to someone special. Now, church family, let me ask you this question. As I began thinking about this message, this question came to my mind. How many of us have stood in the presence of Jesus only to miss the fact that we were in his presence? How many of us have been with family, with friends, in the church, in the car, out somewhere else, and we have been definitively in the presence of Jesus, and yet we have missed it? We have lost the fact that God has been present beside us. He's at our right. He's at our left. He goes with us wherever we go. He sees everything we do. He hears everything we say. And that definitively, we have been in the presence of Jesus, and yet we have missed it. I don't need a show of hands because I know that if you're anything like me, there have been times where I've missed it. And knowing that I've missed it and people close to me have missed it, I'm sure that all of us at some point have missed the fact that we have been in the presence of Jesus. So this morning, as we are starting a brand new teaching series entitled Resurrection Stories, I want to take us back to a moment in the scriptures where two gentlemen journeyed with Jesus, and yet it was completely lost on them that they were standing in the presence of God. If you have a Bible, we will be in the Gospel of Luke. I want to encourage you to follow along with us. If not, the words will be on the screen. We will be on the, in the 24th chapter. I'm going to read through a little bit. I'll break it down. We will discuss it more in detail. But beginning in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 13, it says this. The very next day that day being Resurrection Sunday. Excuse me. Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were walking and discussing together, Jesus drew near them and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. We'll pause right there. Open this up. So we find that there are two gentlemen who are journeying home to Emmaus. What's really interesting about this is that in all of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, this is the only portion of scripture that uses the word Emmaus. This is the only time this town is talked about. We don't know if it's a big city, a small town. We don't know how significant or insignificant Emmaus is. All that we know from Luke's gospel is that it's roughly seven to seven and a half miles in journey from Jerusalem to there. So this week I got on Google Maps and I used the church address to be the starting point and then I proceeded to map out seven miles. So from here, seven miles east is roughly the entrance to the turnpike on State Road 50. So if you can draw that into your mind, could you imagine walking out in front of the church, getting on State Road 50 and heading east to the turnpike? You would walk up, up, up these great mountains or Claremont Hills and down, down, down into the valley. 
There's like one really big hill that like I think all of us would have been like, not today. Where's the car? I'm getting in the car. We're driving the seven miles. But seven miles at roughly a 15 to an 18 minute pace would take them however long that is. I'm not great at math. 140 minutes, roughly. Let's say 20 minutes. So roughly in this two or more hour walk that they would have went on, they would have journeyed together, these two men, from Jerusalem back to their hometown of Emmaus. We're told later on in the text that one of them, their name is Cleopas, and the other disciple's name is unknown. What we know again later on in the text is that these two guys were not a part of the eleven. Now, the 11 that are mentioned later on in the text are the 11 remaining apostles. We know that following the crucifixion and the resurrection, Judas was no longer counted as one of the apostles. And we know that these two men were not among the apostles, but they would have been a part of the disciples who would have showed up to Jerusalem there around that Palm Sunday time for Passover, they would have been some of the disciples very likely who would have laid their palm branches down, laid their cloaks down as Jesus sat on that colt, on that donkey, and rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They would have been very likely those who would have watched and witnessed that event taking place. So for these two gentlemen, Cleopas and the unknown disciple, they are journeying from Jerusalem back to Emmaus, and as they are doing so, they begin talking. They begin talking while they're walking, and they're walking while they're talking, and they're talking while they're walking. For seven miles, what else do you do? There's no iPhones. There's no distractions. There's just the landscape and good company, so they begin talking. And what do they begin talking about? Well, they begin talking about the last week. Because again, they would have been there very likely from the time that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. They would have been amongst the disciples who would have seen the things that Jesus did his last week before the crucifixion. They very likely would have watched as Jesus flipped the table, that Jesus heals people, that Jesus casts out demons. There's a small chance, but still a likely chance, because we see in the text that there were other disciples who were present for the, pass, uh, for the Passover meal, which, which is where Jesus would have instituted the Lord's Supper, that when Jesus would have broke bread, there's a chance that these guys might have been there, and there's something later on in the text that alludes to that. But they begin talking about all these things that are going on. And as they draw in their walk and they draw in their conversation, they begin to discuss eventually Thursday where Jesus is betrayed and arrested. Friday, when he's put on trial and beaten and then crucified. They would have talked about Saturday, how Saturday was probably one of the most depressing days they had ever experienced. They had hope in this Jesus, and now Jesus was dead. They would have talked about Sunday, and how there was now a rumor going around from the women that angels had appeared, that the tombs Uh, stone had been rolled away and that there was no longer a body. And as I began writing this message, I wrote this statement and it it really kind of helped define this message for me. And it's the statement that an empty tomb doesn't prove a resurrection. Because we see these two guys would have went and looked. They would have saw the empty tomb, but yet they struggled to believe in the resurrection. You see, as these two men were walking, and as these two men were talking, walking is so often for Luke in his gospel described as the process of discipleship, that you literally walk it out, that wherever you are in the direction that you are moving, that God is calling you to, you are walking out your faith. So as they are walking it out, and they are talking it out, all of a sudden, Jesus appears. And the question I asked myself is, is like, for these two guys, they struggled with it, but how often do we struggle with it? How often have we heard the word of God or seen the things of God, and yet we don't understand or believe? How often have we heard the word of God preached and proclaimed to us, and yet we struggle to believe? For some of us, we have been coming to church our entire lives. 
We have sat in these pews and we have heard sermon after sermon after sermon. And some of them, we go, that was a really good sermon. Those words were mighty powerful, but yet we have struggled to believe it deep down in our soul. And for others of us, we have seen definitively the things of God. We have seen God move mountains. We have seen God resurrect dead relationships. We have seen God bring back to life things that we thought were definitively dead. And we understand that Jesus is in the business of resurrecting dead things. But yet we have seen the things of God. We have heard the things of God, and yet we struggle to believe in the God behind it all. These two gentlemen had seen what had happened. They had heard what had happened, and yet they struggled to believe what was happening. For these two, their eyes, though, were intentionally being kept from seeing the truth of it all. These two gentlemen struggled because their eyes had been kept from seeing. One commentator, commentator I read on this passage said that it was as if the sun, S-U-N, was in their eyes blinding them from the S-O-N. It's as if the Son of God was using the sun in the heavens to blind these men from seeing him definitively. And we know this to be true because if any of us have ever been out on State Road 50 and have driven towards the sun, you know you need your sun visor down, your sunglasses on, and a whole lot of prayer on, on, on God that none of us will crash, right? We understand that when the sun is blinding, it's hard to see. And as these guys were traversing with the sun, they were struggling to see who it was that was right beside them. They were suffering from spiritual blindness. And for us, church family, there are some of us this morning that are struggling with spiritual blindness that is leading to spiritual death. We are struggling with spiritual blindness, and it is leading us to spiritual death. Luke continues on in his gospel in verse 17, stating these words. And he said to them, Jesus, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, and they looked sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have happened these days. Let me, let me pause real quick and translate this for us. You ready? Um, sir, where have you been? Living under a rock? How do you not know what is going on? So Jesus, hearing this in their voice, responds to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all of the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us, they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. But some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, we did not see. Again, an empty tomb does not prove a resurrection. We find Jesus walking with these men, talking with these men, describing to us this model of discipleship. And as Jesus walks with them and as Jesus talks with them, Jesus asks them plain and simple, tell me what it is that you're talking about. Cleopas's answer was like, listen, we've just been talking about what happened this last week. You, you must have been the only visitor in town who missed what was happening. And Jesus responds to them, okay, no, 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 what things? Jesus presses into these two disciples to go deeper in what they are talking about. 
Jesus wants them to move past a surface level faith to drill down deep and plant strong, firm roots into what it is that they have seen, what they have heard, and therefore what they believe. For some of us, this becomes the thing that we need to begin to start doing. We need to start moving aside the surface level and shallow faith and start to firmly plant and dig down deep good solid roots into what it is that we believe so these two men they respond to jesus as they are talking as they are walking that they had been talking about jesus who is this mighty prophet in word and deed before god and people but they missed it did did you catch it Did you catch how they missed it? Jesus asks them, okay, what are you talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Okay, what about Jesus? Well, he's a mighty prophet. He's a mighty prophet of God. He did great things. He walked on water. He fed the hungry. He clothed the naked. He raised the dead back to life. He did great things, but they missed it. Because they miss the fact that Jesus is more than a prophet. He's more than a man. He is God incarnate. He is the God who steps out of heaven into humanity. He is the God that lives amongst his people. He is the God who willingly goes to the cross and dies on their behalf in order to secure their salvation. They missed the fullness of Jesus. And I hate to say it, but there are some of us this morning who are missing the fullness of Jesus. They were spiritually blind. Their their sight could only take them so far. But here comes Jesus who walks with them and talks with them and helps them move past where they can on their own get themselves. He begins to drill them down deep in order to understand that Jesus is more than just a prophet who said some good things and did some good things. Jesus did the ultimate thing when he went to the cross and he died on behalf of humanity. Jesus was divine. He was divinity. He was God who left heaven and stepped into humanity. And that was what they were missing. And that is what Jesus was drawing their minds back to. But they still missed it because they went on and they're like, well, you know, our chief priests and our rulers, they they delivered him over to be condemned by death to crucifixion. Do we understand that crucifixion was the worst way a person could die? It was filled with shame. They were despised. They were spat on. For so many people at that time when crucifixion was the form of punishment and death that they were condemned to die by, they were beaten before they went to the cross. On many of the cases, They would die simply from the beating. They would then have to carry their own beam and walk themselves to their their death, and then they would be nailed to a cross beam, and they would be dropped into the ground. Research shows that it would be asphyxiation. They would suffocate as they were on the cross, and eventually their heart would stop working. They would die of a massive heart attack. It's true that Jesus died of a broken heart. It would have been an awful, awful way to die filled with so much pain that we had to invent a word to describe it, and the word is excruciating. It means of the cross, pain of the cross, this horrible way to die, and they're talking about it like that's just what Jesus did. And as they talk about that, they talk about him being this prophet who was crucified. They begin to show where their hope really was. They say that our hope was in him to redeem Israel, as if their hope was in some sort of political messiah, somebody who was going to ride into Israel on a horse with a sword and rally the troops and get the army and go to battle to conquer those Roman oppressors because that's what they wanted. They wanted a new kingdom with a new king so that they could be the biggest and best thing on the planet. 
They were hoping for a political savior, and what they got and said was a suffering servant. Jesus didn't come in the way they expected. He didn't live as they expected. He didn't die as they expected. They got so much more from Jesus than they ever expected. And they conclude by saying, and besides all this, it's been three days. Our, our hope is lost. It's been three days. You see, these two men saw the things of God. These two men heard the things of God, yet these two men did not understand. And for some of us, we have seen the things of God, and we have heard the things of God, and yet we struggle to believe because we are struggling with spiritual blindness or spiritual death if we find ourselves dealing with spiritual blindness and spiritual death, today is the day where we can begin to see how Jesus combats spiritual blindness and spiritual death. So instead of their hope being in the God who would save, their hope was in a political Savior who would lead. These men were hopeless in this moment. And yet, even in the midst of their hopelessness, there was still a glimmer of hope. Did you catch it? The stories they tell of the women who went to the tomb that was now empty, that they themselves went to the tomb and it was now empty, and the stories of the angels and the missing body, there's still this glimmer of hope. But an empty tomb does not prove a resurrection. What we find as we continue in the text, starting in verse 25, we find how Jesus combats spiritual blindness and spiritual death. In verse 25, it says this, And he said to them, O foolish ones, this could be translated as those lacking in thought, understanding, or consideration. And you who are slow of heart, this is the idea that they were practicing selective belief. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village of Emmaus to which they were going. He acted, Jesus, as if he were going on still a bit farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in, and he stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And in this act, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon Peter. And they told what had happened on the road and how it was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So how does Jesus combat spiritual blindness and dead faith? You see, Jesus begins to combat this by bringing them back to their roots. Jesus, as he walked with them, took them back to their spiritual roots. He opens the scriptures to them and starting in Genesis he begins to tell them how in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and it was a desolate place and over the course of six days God shapes it and he makes animals and he makes land and he makes water and he creates man and then on the seventh day God does something that most of us struggle to do. He rested. And then Adam and Eve go forward and they, they fall victim 
to sin, and sin enters into the picture, and they are kicked out of Eden. And over the course of time, from Adam and Eve, then comes Noah. And after Noah comes Abraham, and Abraham becomes the father of our faith. And Abraham has a son named Isaac, and Isaac has a son named Israel, and Israel has 12 sons who eventually find themselves in enslavement, in captivity in Egypt. And the text says that Jesus starts to talk about Moses and how Moses goes in and he goes to Pharaoh and he tells Pharaoh to let my people go. And God, for the first time in Scripture, reveals himself to us by his name, Yahweh. And Moses leads the people out of Egypt and he leads them towards the promised land. And then Joshua takes them into the promised land. And after Joshua dies, Israel is led by judges. And after the judges, they demanded that they wanted a king because everybody else had a king. And church, let me just tell you this. If you want something because everybody else wants something, but God's got something better for you, don't go with what everybody else wants. Go with what God wants. Because they wanted what they wanted, and it didn't work out so well. They got Saul. And if you ever read the story of Saul, he's kind of a goofball. And after Saul, you got King David. And David was a man after God's own heart. And after David, you had Solomon. And after Solomon, it just went downhill. And after the kings, they had prophets. You had Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Jonah and Nahum and Habakkuk. And you had all of these prophets who were telling the people, thus says the Lord. And they heard the things of God, and they saw the things of God. And Jesus takes these two disciples on this seven-mile walk deep down in their faith by bringing them back to the gospel, to the good news. That from Genesis to Malachi, there's a small little thread that holds it all together, and it is Jesus. The entire Old Testament is all about Jesus. The entire New Testament is all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, all of the scriptures is all about Jesus. And Jesus walks with these two disciples, and he talks with these two disciples, and he begins to take them deeper in their faith. And then all of a sudden, they, at the end of that conversation, they wind up exactly where they needed to go. Jesus is like, all right, Y'all have at it. I got a couple more things to do up ahead. And they're like, no, 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 no. This is too good. Come on in and have dinner with us. So Jesus goes in. Jesus sits at the table. Jesus takes the bread. He blesses the bread. He breaks the bread. And in that moment, their eyes are open. Their spiritual blindness is gone. They have been resurrected from dead in their faith to alive in Jesus. And for some of us this morning, we need to move from dead in sin to alive in Jesus. That our faith has been questioning. Our faith has been doubting. Our faith has been struggling. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus walks beside these guys. He talks with these guys. He roots them down deep and he illuminates to them and he brings resurrection to their faith. And for some of us, our faith needs a resurrection this morning. You see, the last thing that was said in that verse right there in verse 35 is it says, for these two men, Jesus makes himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. Church family, the story of Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus shows us that spiritual issues and life lessons can be learned, answered, by going down deep in the word of God and by taking a, the time to have a personal investment in the presence of Jesus Christ. So as we think about this, again, I kept coming back to this thought that an empty tomb does not prove a resurrection. No, what proves a resurrection is the personal presence of Jesus Christ. You see, for these two men, they went to the tomb and they, they saw it opened and they saw no body, but for them, they walked away discouraged. They didn't see Jesus. And yet Jesus met them right where they were at 
Jesus meets us right where we are at. Jesus walked with them. Jesus walks with us. Jesus talked with them. Jesus talks with us. And as we go and as they went, Jesus goes with us all. And when they met Jesus personally and they saw the resurrected Jesus, the spiritual blindness came off and their dead faith came to life. So as we go forward, church family, we need to understand that moving forward, we personally meet Jesus in his word. In his word, we see that it gives us insights into spiritual issues. When we struggle with doubt, when we struggle with faith, when we struggle, excuse me, with our walk, we find in the word of God that it gives us insight into spiritual issues. We find that in Jesus' word, in the word of God, it gives us power to resist the temptation to give up, to walk away, to allow our doubts and our fears to take stronghold in our life, that the word of God, when rooted deep down in our hearts, gives us the power to resist. The word of God also gives us the strength to respond to the critics. Now, we know on Resurrection Sunday, there were critics just as much as there were critics on Crucifixion Friday. On Crucifixion Friday, they hurled insults. They spat at him. They pulled out his beard. They degraded him. They made him feel shamed. We know this to be true from what the text tells us. There were critics. There were also critics on Resurrection Sunday saying, you guys are crazy. That never happened. 2,000 years later, we are still dealing with the critics. But yet the Word of God gives us the strength to respond to the criticism. The Word of God gives us the much-needed counsel that we need in order to continue to walk out our Christian faith. And the Word of God illuminates the path for us, the path of Christian life that leads us from where we are to where God is calling us to be. So church family, for us this morning, some of us are walking that Emmaus walk, that seven-mile journey to where God is leading us. And along the path, God walks beside us. He talks with us. He guides our every step. For some of us, we need to trust in him, go deeper down into his word in order that we can clear away the spiritual blindness and move from dead in faith to alive in Christ. May today be your spiritual resurrection Sunday. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day as we know that there are some of us who entered into this room today good with you, God, knowing you, loving you, trusting you, following in all of your ways. We also know that there are some in here this morning who struggle in their faith, that they have been praying, that they have been asking, that they have been seeking to find resurrection in their faith. Father, may today be the day that they come alive in Christ that they begin to see that in your word there is power, there is insight, there is grace, and there is hope because it is alive and it speaks to us. It speaks to us the things that help us to know you, to love you, to trust you. So may we find ourselves finding you in your word. May we grow down deep in our faith and wide in our reach that we might love you and love others because that's what it's all about, Jesus loving you. So bring to life the faith that is in our hearts and help us to know you and love you and trust you. And all these things we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
has to be one of my all-time favorite hymns. Amen. But it's also the charge that I hope to give to you today, that as we depart, we would firmly place our faith on Christ, our solid rock, that we would grow down deep in our faith for him, that we would walk with him, that we would talk with him, that we would come to fully depend upon him, for he is the joy of our salvation. So let me pray for us, church. Heavenly Father, send us forth by your grace in your power to live as resurrected people, understanding that you are bringing dead faith back to life, that in Jesus, dead things, they come alive. So help us to root ourselves on Christ, our solid rock. May he be the firm foundation upon which we stand, and may we go forth living as those who are redeemed and resurrected people. So give us your grace and your hope and send us forth in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you, church family. If you said yes to Jesus today, we have a gift for you in the back along with a bag that you can grab for, the, uh, for our Mother's Day donations. Uh, our ushers will help you exit this uh, afternoon, and we pray that you guys have a blessed day. Take care and God bless.